the word, exorcizo. You know, it means I exercise you, I abjure, I command, I tell you, you must do X. It's a very, very strong word in Greek. And you'll notice in the Gospels in Greek, it is never used by Jesus. His word is a form of ekbalo, I drive out. This is important because the Gospels never say that Jesus exorcised anybody. So exorcism is going to be different from the way in which Jesus behaved in the Gospels. Why? Exorcism is something that a priest or deacon in the Roman Catholic Church does having power over spirits, evil spirits, demons, Satan himself, in the name of the victorious and risen Christ. You say, oh, how cruel. You mean God has allowed this young man or this old woman to be possessed by a spirit that's cruel. The person who is possessed by the spirit has no recollection whatsoever of this happening to him or her. So it is not cruel in that sense. It is a way in which that person is called through the instrumentality of the church to give witness, as this rite it does, of the victory of Christ on the cross and in his resurrection over all the powers of the world, and particularly that most, oh, most malignant power, the devil and the demons. Possession is the coming of a demon or an evil force personified, taking over a person's usually mental faculties. Notice I'm concentrating here on possession of persons, but there can be possession of places and possessions of things. One would think that certain persons would be susceptible to possession. And I think the reason for that is that we associate possession with some type of psychiatric state. And consequently, if one has some type of psychiatric disease, uh, such as, oh, shall we say, uh, schizophrenia, uh, type of double personality, uh, bipolarism, uh, those we would think would be more susceptible to uh, a type of diabolical possession. That is not so. They are their own particular illnesses and they have nothing to do with diabolical process, procession. This person would begin to speak and know languages which the person had never learned, uh, would show an enormous amount of knowledge for events that are happening on the other side of the world, uh, a type of sophistication way beyond the person's educational or maturity level, and there would be very strong signs such as absolute abhorrence and fear of the Eucharist and particularly of the crucifix. This they would just be terrified of. Uh, mentions of saints or anything that would do, particularly the Blessed Mother. And the person's reaction is violent, extremely violent. We do not know why it occurs. We do not know how it occurs. We only know that it occurs. And there is no theological theory uh, saying that this person is more apt to be possessed than that person, or you were possessed because you did X, Y, and Z. You were possessed because you used Ouija boards. You were possessed because you were thinking of devils, etc. Uh, no, we have no sufficient evidence to make such a claim. And therefore to say, well, you were bad, you disobeyed your parents, and consequently the devil, uh, the devil made you do it. The devil made you do it because uh, Bill Cosby would say, if it was the devil made me do it. Uh, no, it's just, we simply do not know. And it isn't a question that the devil made me do it. This is something that you won't even remember. The devil's not making you do anything, etc. It's not you you're being used as a total unconscious instrument of which you have no remembrance whatsoever and no culpability. Who may exercise? 
in the current discipline of the church, a priest or a deacon may exercise, but under very guarded conditions. The first condition, you must have the explicit permission of the ordinary of the place or the local bishop. That must be explicit. You can't assume it, it must be explicit, it must be in writing, very clearly done. Then what characters would be cried? Well, you'd say there are certain characteristics a bishop would choose, a priest who would be older, known for very good holy life, a person who is kind, empathetic, etc., and also smart. Why smart? Because in order to have this case proceed as exorcism, you're going to have to have a complete physical examination of the person who believes that he is ex it, he, subject for exorcism because he believes something more than an ordinary illness, mental or physical, is having to him. Consequently, you're going to have a complete, sophisticated physical examination. Second, you're going to have a very sophisticated, complete psychiatric workup. Then once that's done, then you have another psychiatric workup by another completely different psychiatrist. This is then going to say, well, this person obviously has mental problems, or this is a type of uh, schizophrenia. Uh, oh, this is a person who has a uh, bipolar disease. Uh, you know, sweet as pie one minute and furious the next. Uh, or multiple personalities, a Brody case, you know, where you have three and four people in the same uh, physical persona. Uh, and these, you know, there have been such advances in psychiatry that if that happened, I would say 100 years ago, someone would come out in a very pious way and say, oh, going to bring you to the priest so that he could exercise you, you know. But, but, but that's just not in the modern church. Now, notice in the uh, new ritual, they ask that priests be trained in this. Uh, well, is it trained in using the right of exorcism? No trained in the use of knowing what they don't know. Anybody who's had really good pastoral theological training in a seminary knows what's most important is that you find out what you don't know. You're not, as a priest, capable of handling psychiatric disorders. And don't try it. If these things are done, then the priest who is in charge of that case, deputed by the bishop, will come to the bishop and say, Your Excellency, I think we really have a case here of exorcism. That's what's needed. This is real possession. And the bishop will then pray and will say, Well, Father, do you want to do that? So, well, I, I think it would be some other person who would be more suitable in the diocese, such as Father so-and-so. And the bishop would then say, well, I hope no one more suitable than you since he's completely familiar with the case, etc." So then you're going to end up being the exorcist. When you look at probably the most famous case of exorcism in the uh, United States in the last 50 years, this concerned a boy in St. Louis. It starts, the boy was in Washington, and uh, a priest, very imprudently, uh, went ahead and tried to exercise this youngster without consulting the Cardinal Archbishop of Washington at the time. And uh, the priest was, shall we say, severely cut up by the young boy who broke a mattress, took a spring, and began uh, defiguring him. Uh, he was then sent back to his diocese, which was in uh, St. Louis. And there an exorcism took place by a very wonderful holy Jesuit. The manifestations were not at the beginning of the uh, ritual, but in the ritual. You began hearing, let's say, right after the litany. Uh, you began hearing noises, shouts. Uh, the mattress would rise from the bed, etc. Uh, 
the boy would vomit and expectorate and do all types of things onto the person who was being an exorcist, or the uh, people who were there, the Jesuit seminarians, all of whom were big, strong Midwestern guys, uh, almost football player size, who were literally, literally tossed around like ping pong balls. When you say tossed around, you just say, they were near the, the lad, right? They're supposed to be holding the lad down, and he put the hand on, boom, he'd hit against the wall. Or another person would be hearing him, and bang, he would go right against the floor. I mean, it was just incredible, the power of these demons, and they were on, you know, good, fine Jesuit seminarians. The priest who was doing it was simply covered with uh, excrement of all types, vomit, spittle, uh, and was cursed. The language was absolutely unbelievable that was used. And true cursing, I mean, the taking of holy things in vain, and not just vulgar words, but cursing. And that was going on when you had this quiet rite of prayer going on after the recitation of the litany. And immediately that happened with the showing of the crucifix. Out they went. This process lasted for, I would say, maybe 18 months before, in fact, the uh, demons were expelled. Uh, they took an enormous amount out of the man who was the uh, exorcist, and he needed about six to eight months of rest after it. But he was a very wonderful person. It did succeed. And notice, the young boy did not remember a single thing that had happened. None. Uh, that's just strange what happens with exorcism. It takes place on a, on a person who is possessed, which means he has no recollection whatsoever that his body, mind, uh, facilities, whole, physique, etc., has been used by the devil. None. Which is a blessing. Because notice, this is to show the glory and the power of Jesus over this evil spirit. It's not to inflict or to hurt this particular boy or any person who's being exercised. Now you say, well, the movie The Exorcist by Bill Blatty, is that an exact replica? Because certainly that movie was based on this case. Bill Blatty was Jesuit educated. Bill Blatty was actually the uh, director of publicity for Loyola University. He knew Jesuits, Jesuits talked about this case, and he had this book written, The Exorcist. And the movie uh, was then done by Friedkin, who has a wonderful visual imagination and sort of heightened things. Uh, but does that have a correspondence to the particular case in which it was based? No, it's highly exaggerated. Uh, in fact, when I saw The Exorcist, I was scared, you know. It was not presented as a peaceful and kind, uh, gentle way of praying and beseeching the Lord to release uh, this person from the horrible scourge of being used as an instrument of the devil. Uh, and all this business about heads being turned, you know, I remember when that first happened in the, the film, I was <laughs> just, I was scared to death. Ready to death. <laughs> Now that's quite exaggerated. One of the most fascinating questions that, and I often get it, is um, where do evil spirits go after they have been expelled from, let's say, a place, a thing, and particularly a person? Where do they go? And the answer to that is we know that they return somehow to that realm of darkness called the realm of Satan, where Satan lives. Uh, are they in this world? Be very careful what you mean if this world. Uh, do you mean the material world of our present cosmos, etc., Or do you mean something else by that, such as the world of spirit that is apart from the material cosmos that is expanding at such an enormous rate of speed and hundreds of thousands of miles, light years per second. No, 
We're not dealing with that reality of the physical universe. We're dealing with the reality of a total spiritual realm, and we do not know how that works. To say they returned to there means we don't know what X is, but they went to X. It doesn't get us very far. It's, a, it's just a way of speaking. We have no concrete idea of where X is. The rite of exorcism is not something where you're meeting the devil in an hysterical way. What is required of, a, of an exorcist, if I read Canon 1172 correctly, is a person of balance, great experience, and great calm. A depth of calm that comes from deep spirituality so that you're not thrown off and getting upset. Now, certainly, the uh, demon that is possessing the person wants that more than anything else to have the priest lose, as I say, his cool. And no, you don't do that. That's, that would be giving in to the demon. So you need a person who is mature, very well practiced, and keeps the calm regardless of what happens. The uh, Jesuit who is in the Allen book there was an amazingly calm person. Here's somebody, you know, spitting in his face with abundant spittle, just saying, now, Lord Jesus, we are asking quietly, oh, yes, Jesus, let's go. Never letting any of that got to him at all. Just be keeping quiet, peaceful. This is a ritual. It is a sacramental of the Roman Catholic Church. As a result, it is something that requires devotion, quiet, peace, understanding, and it is a form of public prayer of petition, very much like the administration of the sacrament of baptism. It's just a takeoff of baptism. It's not a rebaptism, but it's a takeoff. It's an imitation of baptism because you have the rite of baptism is followed almost to a T, of course, elongated, and then ending with either the deprecative form. Lord Jesus, we ask you please to, in the name of the Holy Spirit who is here, to drive out the demon from this person or the very strong mandatory way, I command you in the name of the victorious Christ, leave that person now. Mm. And you can imagine, you know, they don't want to leave. They don't want to leave. Uh, notice that you don't do things like this, you know, get mad. This is what you would not do, right? Well, I've had enough of this stuff coming out of you. Go back to hell where you belong. No, 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 no. Pious, balanced, calm, confident, knowing that the victory of Christ in the end will be victorious over this particular manifestation of the devil's power. For what? To show the power of Jesus risen over everything, even this.